Well, in the, those days, it seems like one enemy goes, one enemy is brought down. In this case, it was Saul, uh, who had himself come to a new faith in Jesus after his experience on the road to Damascus. But one goes, and another arises. And in this case, it's King Herod. Uh, here's a, a suggested picture of what he might have looked like. Uh, now, this was Herod Agrippa, a grandson of Herod the Great, who was around at the time of Jesus' birth, but time has moved on. He was uh, a ruler in Judea. He was a provincial king uh, under the authority of the Roman governor. Now, of course, this was all part of the devil's strategy. Uh, he likes to send people against uh, the people of God. He'd sent Saul. Saul had now stepped back, and he brings forth Herod Agrippa instead. And of course, the, the way uh, the disciples of Jesus were considered to be a dangerous sect of the Jewish faith, not popular with the Jewish leaders at all, and it seemed like uh, the actions that Herod Agrippa was taking uh, were popular with the Jewish people, certainly the Jewish leaders. And uh, so he thought, well, uh, one thing leads to another. And he says, well, this is making me more popular with the Jews, so I'll just keep going with this attractive new strategy of mine. And... <clears throat> The sorts of things that we read about here are the very things that happen in certain parts of our world today. I would imagine even since the 1st of January, uh, over these last four or five days, people have been persecuted, have been imprisoned, have been killed for their faith in Christ. Um, at this point in the book of Acts, it was uh, still an unusual thing. Uh, Stephen had died, and now somebody else dies, uh, and they're becoming familiar with this pattern. And it's a familiar pattern in other parts of our world, particularly what we would call the 1040 window, where there's quite a lot of countries uh, which are not uh, kind of from a Christian background, may have another faith background, uh, and so the Christian faith is seen as a threat. And so they take just the sort of action that headed Agrippa did here. Now, that's not generally our experience and wouldn't be the experience in the Western uh, world. Uh, what would have once been called Christendom but is now a post-Christian society. And we, we may wonder, well, why is that? Why don't we face persecution? Is it because of this uh, wonderful kind of liberal democracies that we live in or so we're so tolerant and so understanding and so keen for us to pursue our faith? Or is it simply because uh, our faith is not as strong or as clearly proclaimed as it could be, and so we're not actually a threat any longer to wider society, and they're happy enough for us to continue on being Christians the way we are Christians today. I'll leave that for you to consider and decide yourselves. Well, what actually happened here? What, what specific action did Herod take? Well, uh, the very first thing was to put James to death by the sword. I think possibly the one on the right is Peter. This is from the Jesus video. I don't know, maybe the one on the left is James, not too sure. Uh, this is James, the brother of John, not James, the brother of Jesus, who was a different person. But he was one of the, what you could call the big three, Peter, James, and John. So the brother of John, and uh, one of those three that went up with Jesus to the Mount of Transfiguration and, and saw Jesus in his glory. And so he was a significant figure within the early church, but didn't live for very long to pursue uh, his ministry amongst the other believers. And this would have been a real blow, a real shock, a real sadness and tragedy to the church at that time. 
to lose this man, James. And then Herod, seeing that this was approved of by the Jews, then thought, right, well, let's go a step further. Let, let's arrest Peter. You know, that's a, a level above James. He, he's the leader of the early church, the, the people of the way, the disciples of Jesus. And so he is imprisoned. And we may wonder, well, how does God determine who lives and who dies? How does he decide that, well, James, I'm going to sacrifice him, but I need Peter for a little bit longer? Uh, God's will, how can it be kind of met by one person dying, but yet at the same time, one person living, at least for a time, because we know uh, from um, history that Peter himself probably was executed sometime later in Rome. How does God decide these things? Well, that's not an easy question. But it, it did uh, push me to have a look at Hebrews chapter 11, which is a chapter all about faith and all about the people of faith through the centuries of the biblical record from the Old into the New Testament. Uh, and there I'll just read a few additional verses uh, from verse 32. What more shall I say, says the writer? I don't have time to tell you about Gideon, Barak, Samson, and Jephthah, about David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, gained what was promised, who shut the mouth of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again, a whole bunch of miracles described there just in those few short verses. But then, there's a sudden change in the middle of verse 35. There were others who were tortured, refusing to be released so that they might gain an even better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging, and even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and in holes in the ground. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised, since God had planned something better for us, so that only together with us would they be made perfect. So it's a passage in the New Testament that has this kind of real contrast between those who saw amazing miracles and were saved and delivered in, in, in the persecution and others who suffered horrifically and died. And so that contrast between James and Peter and what happened to them in this chapter is displayed in quite a bit of detail in Hebrews chapter 11. And what seems to be the case is that God can actually use all of these things, whether it's good in human terms or whether it's bad in human terms, for his plans, his purposes, and his glory. Uh, and for all of us, and for them, I think this little phrase in verse 39 of Hebrews 11, none had yet received what was promised. Uh, and so the reward isn't uh, to live a long life, to live a comfortable, peaceful life. The reward is, is beyond this world. The reward is, is a place in God's kingdom, in the kingdom of heaven, in eternity. That's the reward, not these things that we think often are important. 
in our world, in our lives today. Things we often cling on to, but they aren't the important thing. The important thing uh, is yet to come. And James and Peter, I'm sure, would have been aware of that when they laid down their lives sacrificially at different points. But here in this account, something remarkable happens as far as Peter's concerned. An angel of the Lord turns up. And despite all the soldiers and the sentries, was it four groups of four, so at least 16, possibly more, guarding him, because presumably Herod Agrippa realized how significant this prisoner was, all the chains and the gates, which it seems, and I'm sure were, firmly locked, an angel appears and leads Peter out to freedom. Uh, what exactly happened to the, the soldiers and the guards? We don't know whether they fell asleep, whether they just didn't see him, whether they were unconscious. We don't know. We are told what happens to the, the gates. They just unlocked themselves. Gates of uh, Judean prisons didn't normally unlock themselves. But miraculously, the angel of the Lord leads Peter out to freedom. And it seems at first as though he's confused because nothing like this has ever happened to any of the other believers. He knew that James had died, so he wasn't necessarily expecting to live. But as he leaves, he starts to rejoice in the power and glory of God and what God has done in his life own life. Uh, I mentioned a couple of weeks ago um, Brother Yoon, who is a leader of the early church, and uh, here's a picture of him, more recent picture on the left, um, older picture on his book, The Heavenly Man, on the right. So leader of the early church, I don't think these days he spends much time there because there's a kind of price on his head, effectively. Uh, and over the years, as a leader of that church, he would be arrested on a fairly re regular basis, spend time in prison. And in his book, he describes one particular instance where he was tortured in the prison. He had both his legs broken. And it was at that point that God turned up for him. Uh, there wasn't an angel involved, although maybe there was one kind of invisibly in the background, but as he left, walking on his two broken legs, which in itself would be a miracle, uh, like Peter, the doors and gates and chains just fell off and, and opened before him, and he had a very similar experience. That's what he testifies to in his book, The Heavenly Man. Uh, it seems that there were some official event investigations. I'm not aware that any of the guards were executed in this particular case. Uh, some of the things that came out of the official investigation apparently were statements like embarrassing mishap. Um, if somebody escaped from Lomas prison, I think it would be more than embarrassing mishap, to be honest. Uh, and the other phrase, no human help. So hopefully that means the guards did survive Brother Yoon's escape from jail. So a, a, a modern day example of a similar thing happening through the power of God. And again, we could say, well, why Brother Yoon? And why not others that have been imprisoned for their faith? But what about the church? What about the church's response to all that was going on, these deaths, these arrests, what were they doing? Well, you wouldn't be surprised to learn that they were praying, uh, because that's one thing that persecution encourages you to do. And I know that some of us here are keen to pray for the persecuted church and get material from people like Barnabas with prayer points to do just that. Well, uh, early on in, the, in this account, we read that they were earnestly praying to God for him, that is Peter. What it doesn't tell us is what they were praying for. Uh, 
Uh, were they praying that he would just be comfortable in prison? Were they praying that uh, he would not be tortured in prison? Were they praying that he would not be executed in prison? Or were they praying that he would be released miraculously? The way that this unfolds, I suspect that it was probably towards the lower end of the scale, just praying that God would be close to him, that he would be comforting him in jail. But it seemed like there were doubts. If James died, why should we expect any more for our brother Peter? Again in verse 12, um, just before Peter knocks on the door, we read that many people had gathered and were praying. Again, we don't know what they were praying for. Were they praying for that release? I'm not sure they were. They were filled with doubts because of the death of James. They probably feared to raise their hopes. And even when Peter knocks on the door and Rhoda goes to open it, hears his voice and, and without even opening the door, runs back, and it's clear that the angel had gone because the angel doesn't open the door of the house to let Peter in. And she says, Peter's at the door. And they don't immediately respond, well, our prayers have been answered. They say, you're out of your mind. Maybe that's, uh, this clearly wasn't what they were expecting. And then they come up with this kind of odd idea, well, maybe it's Peter's angel. Uh, but don't know how that works. Maybe some idea that people have guardian angels there in the early church. But what was true was when they realized that indeed it was Peter standing at the door, they were astonished, as he had been, that he was released, and probably even more astonished when he explained how he had been released by the appearance of this angel. Uh, and maybe we, like even the early church then, I mean, we probably don't even pray as much as they prayed, but when we do pray, we pray maybe at the lower end of the scale for kind of what we consider to be the, the best in the circumstances. Uh, we pray like, well, just be close to them. Give them comfort and peace in their difficult circumstances. And we, like them, we don't pray for the big miracle, but we should be encouraged by this story to pray for the big miracle. Uh, now, we maybe don't know so many people uh, in prison. I do, and I know a few people in prison. I'm not praying that they would get supernaturally released by an angel, but I'm praying that they do get released in due time and make something good of their lives when they're released. Uh, but we need to remember that God is the God of the impossible. Uh, and so we're praying fairly extensively for Pam last week in terms of her diagnosis. And we should be praying for the big miracle for Pam in her life and body. We should be confident and ready to pray for the big miracle, not just for the kind of small miracle which seems easier. So what were the outcomes here of this passage? Well, there was quite a lot of death. James, the brother of John, died at the hands of Herod, and at least for a short period of time, that knocked the church's confidence considerably. The poor guards, were called collateral damage, I think you would call them, it seemed like there was at least 16 of them. Herod was more than a little upset that this key church leader, Peter, had escaped. He did an investigation and uh, may have reckoned, well, there was no human help, but that didn't save the guards. He had them all executed. But then perhaps there is justice because Herod himself goes off on a little tour down to Caesarea uh, to negotiate with some local folks who are a little bit upset with him. And he does this great speech 
uh, wins them over. Uh, they say things like, well, this is like the voice of God speaking. I kind of have this picture in my mind of Donald Trump going into a, a, a supportive area, <laughs> and he's telling them all about how he's going to assassinate one of the Iranian generals, and they're thinking, well, this is the voice of God. And of course, he gave the glory not to God for his fine words, but to himself. And justice is done because he is struck dead. Uh, and he dies for all the bad things that he has been responsible for in his life. Again, we could say, well, why? You know, Saul, uh, he was struck blind on the road to Damascus, brought to faith. Uh, Herod, God doesn't bother anymore with him. He was struck dead, and that was the end of his life. I dare say God was able to see into these people's hearts and see what the potential was if they had a real encounter with him. He saw potential in Saul, but really nothing uh, of any further benefit in Herod. But set against that picture of death and all these different people who died in this chapter, we see life as well. The final verse, verse 24, the word of God continued to spread and flourish. Uh, and that, of course, is, is another word for people coming to faith in Christ, people being born again, new life in Christ appearing within the church. They've already had thousands, and there were thousands more coming to faith, which was why the Jewish leaders were so concerned about these people, this new sect of Judaism, the way. And that explosive growth was happening despite persecution. And in most human contexts, if people faced persecution, it would close down whatever it was that they were doing. But not here, because they were pursuing kingdom principles. They were boldly proclaiming the word of God. That's what God got Peter into prison. That's what got James killed. They were bold in proclaiming the word of God. They were praying. Maybe they weren't always praying for the big miracle, but they were praying. They were prepared to sacrifice, not just their comfort, but their lives to get the word out there and to transform the world, to turn it upside down. And then they saw miracles, uh, because that seems to be when God shows up, when his people run out of things to do, when it, it seems like they're confronted by a brick wall. Then all they can do is pray for a miracle, and all they can hope for is for God to turn up and to do that a miracle. And we certainly, in 21st century Scotland, in the 2020s in Scotland, need to recover those four same things. The boldness that the Holy Spirit gives us to proclaim the good news about Jesus, no matter what reaction we get. To pray, to back it up with prayer, and to take our prayer up the gauge from the small miracles to the big miracles, and believe that God will do the impossible. To be willing to sacrifice, maybe none of us will be faced with the, the sacrifice that James gave here, but to sacrifice a little bit of comfort, a little bit of reputation, uh, sacrifice some of the good things that we enjoy here in our lives. We need to be willing to make sacrifices and when we do these things, God will turn up and he will do miracles. Uh, and while people in our culture might be very dismissive of Christian things, of the, the, the Bible, of the stories that we might share with them about Jesus, when it's backed up with miracles, they will start to question uh, whose reality it is the true reality. Because when miracles happen, it starts to knock down people's long-held positions.
So just as we reflect on that call on us to be bold, to be prayerful, to be sacrificial, and to be open to the miracles of God, let's pray as we prepare to come around the Lord's table. Our Father, we thank you uh, for that story uh, and all the amazing things that happen in it. Uh, We find it perhaps hard to believe that these kind of things could happen in our world today. We heard of the story of Brother Yoon and how he testified to a very similar thing happening for him. And we're aware that there are perhaps something like a hundred million born-again believers in China today uh, because of things like this happening. Uh, And Lord, we rarely see things like this happening here in Scotland. The spiritual temperature of our nation is, is well below many other nations in the world, even those, probably especially those where there's persecution. And Lord, it's not like we want persecution to happen, but perhaps we should be open to it if that is one way in which we can become more bold, more prayerful, more sacrificial, and more open to believe that you can and will do miracles amongst us. And so, Lord, send us into this coming week, this year, this decade, with that sense that you're going to do something new, you're going to do something different, you're going to do something astonishing that will turn the tide in Scotland in these days. And we ask that in Jesus' name.